anyways, it, it works great most of the time, but when they have an outage, you you really notice it. Um, and it usually lasts a little bit. But anyways, all right. Um, let's uh, we can get started here. Um, so week two, um, week two. Um, you know, really, we're gonna start diving into select statements. Um, so anyways, I'm just going to kind of jump through this PowerPoint, um, real quick, and then maybe we'll hit a couple of the exercises to kind of walk through as well as, you know, we'll talk through a bunch of the select statements. Um, in, in the announcement, I should have posted, there should have been an, a, a bunch of links to these little, I like to call them quick bites. Cause you know, we do these longer class recordings, but, um, I wanted like a quick way just to kind of like get people, you know, updated on like what it does, like with the, so anyways, there's some couple quick bites on some different parts of the select statement, which we'll, we'll kind of cover here as well. Um, but anyway, so oh, I always do that. Let's not download it. Let's just look at it here. So anyways, let's zoom just a little bit. So um, basically we're going to cover select statements and what select statements do, they're kind of like considered the bread and butter of SQL because, you know, what's the point of having a database? Well, it's so we can obviously store information, but why do we store information? Well, it's so we can call upon it at some point. Um, so, you know, we want to be able to pull data back out of the database, which is what we're going to be to, to be learning. That's what the select statement does. It pulls data back out of the database. So anyways, they're called clauses. There's different components to a select statement and you don't need all of them um, to make it work. And each one of them does different things. So I'm not going to cover these all right now because it's way more fun to actually see it, you know, happen. Um, but, you know, this is a nice little summary um, that you can reference. Um. But um, what I did want to cover, because we'll get back to this, but there, there's a couple different types of, quote, tables, you know, and, and whenever we say table, you can think about a traditional table where we have, just like what we're looking at, right? We have two columns, name and description, then we have these rows that each contain a value for each one of the fields. Um, so there's permanent tables, um, and these are tables like what we see in the Sequila database, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and these are called permanent tables because they, they're these long-term structures. Um, I always like to equate a database to a house, um, you know, because there, there's these different things that we can do to it. Um, because and just like it says, it's very permanent. And so when we build a table, it it's there for the long haul. Like once we define it, it's there and it won't go away it can't be changed really unless we explicitly like tell it to. Um, in fact, there's a couple different types of, of kind of categories of SQL. Um, there's data definition language, DDL. Um, and that's more like, I define that as like, you're building the house, right? So we can build a table that has nothing in it. Just like we can build a house that doesn't have any furniture or anything inside of it. And then what we do is we we fill it with with things, you know, and that's the data manipulation language. You know, we can bring things into the house. We can take things out of the house, all this different stuff. But, you know, it doesn't change the house. We just change what's what's in it, so to speak. Um, but that's why they're permanent. They're very permanent structures. Once they're created, um, you know, they're they're kind of there. Um, derived tables. Um, we're going to talk more about subqueries in the future, but derived tables are basically subqueries, which when we write a select statement, that's essentially, uh, depending on where it sits, it could be a derived table. A temporary table, when they say a volatile data held in memory, that's like whenever we write a select statement, I consider that a temp table. You can actually kind of build a temp table very specifically in SQL. So, you know, this one is specifically a subquery, which means that it's inside of another statement. So like I said, we'll get to those. The difference between a derived table and a temp table is derived tables are subqueries. Temp tables are basically kind of more standalone. And then the last kind of category we have is a virtual table, um, which is 
of you. And you'll always hear these references of you. Um, they're explicitly defined, but they're, it's like saving a select statement and it acts like a table. In fact, if you didn't know it was a view, you'd, you'd never know other than it has a couple limitations. And we'll, we'll, again, we go over these later. This is more just kind of letting you, letting you know. So like, here's a subquery, right? We'll, we'll talk more about those attempt table. Like I said, it's more explicitly defined and then a view where you actually create a view. And, and we dive in deeper into those in the future. So we'll definitely hit those. Um, so table aliases, um, you know what? I'm just going to skip through some of this because we may just start going into, yeah, let's, uh, let's just dive right into a demo here. So um, I'm going to do a couple real quick select statements just to kind of walk you through some of the different kind of components and, and when we use them and why. So the first thing I'm going to do is use Sakila, make sure we have the database selected, because this is going to be the first kind of week where we're um, querying data. So I like to kind of keep my log down here, um, as well as keep, obviously, the, the results section here. Um, so we'll use Sakila. You can see that it, it worked. Um, so what we could do is, like, we have a few different tables in here um, of a bunch of different things, and, and we can explore those. So I'm going to select... Um, this is usually how I do it. I select everything from payment and I just kind of start looking for, you know, what's in the tables, um, kind of just like getting a feel for what's in there. That's usually like whenever I hit a database, it's kind of like my first thing. Um, and if I'm looking at this, we have some interesting data here. So I'm going to use this table as kind of our basis for building some of these select statements. And what this is is it's all of our payments. So whenever we received money, it's it's a list of our transactions, our incoming transactions where customers paid us money. You can see we have a, a customer ID here um, that links to the customer table. Um, staff ID, same thing. Rental ID, same thing. We can see like which rental this payment was for, so on and so forth. And then payment ID is our primary key. Um, and you're gonna hear about primary key, but primary key is, the unique identifier. There can never be more than one payment ID in the payment table. And this primary key is how people link back to payments. So that's how I always visualize um, relational databases is it's a bunch of links. And the way we link to things is by saying like, oh, this customer ID that links to the customer ID primary key. Um, and this is called a foreign key. So the foreign keys should and usually reference primary keys. So that's kind of how we can link all this data together. Um, anyways, so those, those become important with joins, which we'll talk about. So let's, uh, I'll stay on task here. So whenever we're using select statements, um, usually they're all caps. It's kind of like the, the default. Um, I'm super also used to Postgres, which prefers lowercase. So it's a little bit of those like weird flavor. I'm going to try and do it all in caps, just because it, it does help it be more readable, in my opinion. So I'm going to select everything from payment. And, you know, by default, we get everything. So the select asterisk is basically means select everything. And what I mean by select everything, select all the columns. So that's what this asterisk means is select all the columns. Um, God, Workbench is really struggling, isn't it? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm asking about something you said a few minutes ago, but um, I just want to be sure I understood uh, the kind of uh, type of tables. Uh, uh, is the derived tables like uh, when when you when you type a query? Uh, from a table and when you get the results, is that the derive, uh, derived table? Um, so not really, because um, once it's kind of executed, it's it's out of memory, like it prints it and it's kind of gone. Mm, okay. um, and so so really a derived table is when we, we use a subquery is what it's called. 
Um, and I'll show you one, in fact. So. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. OK, I understand. Uh, because sometimes you uh, type a query and inside it, you, um, uh, you type another query that will work with the result of, of the of the previous one. Yes, exactly. That is what you're talking. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, that is in, that should be in memory so it can be used. Okay. Yep. Yep, exactly. Cuz um right. when we write these select statements and we'll talk a little bit about this, you know, really they execute and they're done. So like, you know, mm -hmm. I click this, well, oh, it's not working, is it? Maybe we'll be switching to command line here before too long. Um, you know, when we, in fact, I guess I can switch. Um, so when we when we run this, it runs, and as soon as it executes, it gets the data and it prints the data out. And at that point, it's it's kind of done running, so to speak. Um, and so all it was in memory at one point, but it's kind of gone. And so when it kind of when you think about storing in memory. Think about it more long term, where it's going to sit there for a minute. Um, okay. So, like for example, just like that, like a derived table, it sits there for the inside of that other query for the duration of that other query. Um, and so, anyways, yeah, it gets a little funny, but basically, yeah, just like you said, the derived table is a query inside of another one that kind of acts as a table. So, you know, I can kind of show you here in a really kind of backwards kind of a way. Um, you know, I can say select everything from, and instead of having just the table name, I can actually give it this query. And what, and, and this will actually work or it should work. Um, and you'll see it actually, this is interesting. It says every derived table must have its own alias. So I can just give it an alias. Um, of T and then boom, it works. So in this case, this mm -hmm. is our derived table. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But that's a good, uh, good segue. So, you know, normally we, we write our select statements, um, you know, and this is pretty much like one of the simpler select statements we can write where we're selecting everything from, and we say the table that we want to select from. So this is the from clause and it's always the first thing to execute. And I always like to equate the select statement is like going to actually physically get like some records out of filing cabinet, right? Um, one of the reasons I love databases is because they're, they're extremely logical. So, you know, let's picture we have this filing cabinet and we know what we want to go get. Now, you know, let's say we're looking for a specific folder. Now we know we know what we're looking for. And so the first step, you know, is we have to say like where we're getting it from, you know, so, you know, maybe, you know, let's say we have a single filing cabinet and, you know, each drawer is like a different set of things. Like, let's say one drawer is our payments. So, you know, the first thing we want to do is say like, oh, I'm looking for my payments. Here's all of my records. Well, that's step one, right? Where are we getting the data? Well, we're getting it from payment. The next step of the data is to kind of say, hey, let's start filtering down. So here's all my payments. What, what one am I specifically looking for, right? And let's say in this case, I want to find all my payments that are from the, the year 2005, 2005 and let's say July, right? So July two, 2005. So I can say like, hey, you know, I want the month of payment date to be equal to 2005, right? That's the that's the first step. I can select that. In fact, let's just run it. Oh. Apple's latest update does not want to play well with uh, SQL Server, apparently. So we can run this again here. And, oh, and I said month, we want the year, sorry. Where the year of payment date is equal to 2005, maybe. 
here. We're going to swap here for just a second. Sorry. My SQL. I'm just going to switch eyes here for a minute since that one is uh, struggling. That's my username. All right, there we go. So this may look a little different. Just know it's basically the same thing, just a little bit different screen. So here we go. We have this. I'm going to use Sakila. All right, so we're going to use Sakila. And then what I'm going to do is we will pull up uh, and let me grab that. Let's just rewrite it. So we're selecting everything from payment where the year of payment date is equal to 2005. So now what we're doing, so we open the folder, the payment folder, and you know they have those manila envelopes. We're looking for the one where it's 2005. Okay, there's your 2005. Let's say there's a bunch of folders inside there as well that each one, or let's say a sheet of paper, each one you know is a month. We can also say, hey, you know, we only want to find the month where payment date, the month of payment date is equal to, in this case, seven. So now if we look through our data, you know, so if like we were looking for the data, we could then pull out all these that we just found. And hey, you know, we just have July 20, 2005, um, you know, here. So we have a bunch of data, but it's all from July. And that's kind of the way that it works. It, it first looks from like, where are we getting the data? And then the next step is it has what's called the where clause. And, you know, we combine this with the and keyword. There's an and and an or, because obviously you can do, do logic, but uh, this is all kind of considered the where clause, which is really filtering the data. So it, the way it kind of works is the database gets all the records and then it kind of filters through them based on the criteria you provide. Now we're gonna kind of change things up. Oh, and then the last thing that it does is it prints out the data. So what you have here, so let's say for example, I only wanted to see the amount, you know, obviously it's only gonna show the amount column. So that's kind of the last step, even though it basically gets it all because it has to be able to filter it. Um, but then the last step is it kind of says like, oh, what does the user wanna see? And that's the last step. So it kind of skips the first bit and then it goes kind of order from here. And that's the order in which it runs. Um, so a couple of the other clauses that you'll see and um, want to preface this, that basically we don't need to worry about this right now. Um, you're probably going to see um, like, we're going to come across this in a later week. So I'm showing you this, so you know what the clause does, but we don't need to kind of fully understand it right now. Um, but there's what's called a group by clause. And what group by does is it allows us to group columns together. So if we look at our results set here, you'll notice that we have like a bunch of data, right? Like each one is an individual record. And let's say we were just trying to say like, oh, how much money did we make of July of that year? And just like I did before, if I select amount, you'll notice that, oh, it, uh, you know, it's still individual rows. Um, so if we wanted to kind of summarize those, we have to do what's called uh, an aggregate function. And an aggregate function 
is basically anytime we take multiple rows and we combine them in some way and we condense it down into fewer rows. Um, so let's say that we wanted to see the sum by, you know, month, right? So now this is obviously 2005, July, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, hey, how much did we make in each month in 2005? So now what I can do is I can use a sum function and put amount here. Now by default, if I only have selected the aggregate function, it'll still work. So in the year 2005, I made almost 67K of, of revenue. But what happens if we want to see that broken up by month, right? Um, so what I can do is I can say, hey, we also want to see it by the month of payment date, right? And I'm going to give this an alias as, let's call it payment month, and then a comma to separate between the columns. So now I'm going to run this and it's going to throw an error and it's going to say in aggregated query without group by clause. And basically it's telling us what's missing and that's that, that group by. So whenever we have an aggregate function with something else that we want to group it by, in this case, the month, we have to basically tell it to group it by those things. So we're just going to say, hey, group this by group the sum of revenue by the payment month. So now you can see that in July, this is how much money. So it looks like we started in May. We had like a short month in May or maybe it was just slow and we slowly ramped up and the business started performing quite well, as you can see. So that's what the group by does. Now, um, let's say we want to filter this again. Now there's, you know, the where clause is already here, right? We're getting it where the year is equal to 2005. But let's say we also wanted to say like, oh, you know, this was a half month. I don't care about this. I only want to see the months where we did more than $5,000 worth of revenue, right? Well, I can't add another where clause up here. And it, I can't add it here because remember that goes in chronological order. Um, so from the where clause, so it's already filtered. This is already ran before we group by. So we have to kind of do it a different way. And they have the clause built just for filtering aggregations and it's called having. So I can say having a sum of amount that is, let's say greater than $5,000. And you'll notice it just took that, that result out. And that's the having clause. And again, we're going to come back to group by and having in a future week. But the last thing that we have is um, an order by. So we can order by payment month. So we can actually, and the order by basically just sorts the results. So in this case, they just happen to be in order. But um, so that's not going to do anything. But let's say we wanted to see the most recent first. We could change this to say, hey, sort this descending. And then you'll notice that now we have August 1st and it goes backwards in history. So you can tell it when you're sorting to either go ascending or descending. And by default, it does ascending. So you don't need to type it every time. But um, if you want it to be descending, you have to do that. All right, I'm going to pause there real quick. Does anyone have any questions about just like the real basic select statement? No, all, all clear by the time. Yeah, I don't Perfect. I don't have any questions on the select statement. I took a um, SQL class last semester, so I'm kind of more or less familiar with all this so far. Perfect. Yeah, and I, I think many will be um, in the class, which is great. Um, but I yeah, like to cover I, it just, just to be sure. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, and I think um, if it's too little on my screen, so I don't know if you could... Um, like zoom it. Uh, is that yes. is possible? Because it's too little. I believe I can hear somewhere. I'm probably jumping ahead of myself as well, but I, I was looking at the assignments and I saw that 
we're supposed to record a video of the deconstructed website. So I didn't know if like there was maybe an example video you could put that we could maybe take a look at or something. Yeah. Again, so maybe, maybe I'm ahead of myself, but you know, you know, your timing's perfect. That's literally where we're going to jump to next. Um, yeah, exactly where we're going to jump to next. So I wanted to, uh, yes, now that we got that out of the way, let's shut this down. Um, so the, yeah, perfect segue. So in this, this week, instead of a paper, what we have is we have like what's called reverse engineering website. Now it's pretty easy to get carried away with this. Um, so I would say, keep it, keep it relatively simple. Um, and really it's more of a great way to hopefully learn a little bit about workbench. Um, this is kind of like a segue into, Hey, one, it's good, but it is kind of a nice prep because next week we're going to talk about final projects and um, hopefully it kind of helps you see like, oh, this isn't so bad. You know, um, I could do the final project. Um, but basically what the task is, is we're going to pick any website that kind of has data. Um, the one kind of cool thing that you kind of learn as you as you go through this content is you realize just how how vital databases are to practically everything. Um, so you can you can kind of do a lot of uh, kind of reverse engineering from a lot of different things. So, um, and you know, it says pick a website. I don't necessarily um, care if it's quote a website, it could be an app, it could be, you know, a game, anything like that. The idea is that we take it and we reverse engineer it and try to kind of say like, hey, if I had a guess on how this database was set up, this is how it would kind of be put together. Um, so anyways, I haven't really looked at, at any websites, but, um, one I kind of always do, um, is an example is, is canvas itself. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. Now you have two kind of different options. You can do it in a spreadsheet, which, which works. Um, but I'm going to show you the, the ERD way, because honestly, it's in my opinion, it's just as fast. In fact, maybe be faster. Um, because you know, it's billed for it. So anyway, so I'm going to kind of like reverse engineer kind of like a part of canvas, so to speak. So, um, in workbench, what you can do is you can come up to database and we can, well, really what we can do is we can say file, we can say file and then new model, I believe maybe. Let's try again. No, maybe. Let me see if they got an update here real quick. is anyways while i'm doing this i guess i'll show you um i could show you a little bit of of the google version here that's getting downloaded so what we can do is we can um, basically the concept is we want to start by identifying tables, right? And, and like I said, it's easy to get carried away because most of these are like, you know, more sophisticated databases that probably have a lot going on. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. Okay. We're just looking for kind of like this quick exercise more to kind of try to figure out, you know, if we can see what's going on. So, um, anyways, what we can do is, you know, like if I'm thinking about Canvas, right, you know, we have, and, and I always like to think like, okay, what's the quote root data? Um, you know, so is it, is it the classes? Is it the students? Is it the assignments? Is it the scores? You know, those kinds of things. 
um, that's kind of what I always like to, to think about. Cause I always like to kind of start it like, Hey, what's the, what's the root data. And then I like to kind of build from there. So in my opinion, in canvas, kind of the root of the data is, is the courses themselves. They're kind of like the container for everything. Now there's a bunch of different kind of bits and pieces that connect all throughout there, but you know, really it could be a bunch of, bunch of tables all interconnected. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start here and I'm going to call it um, a course, right? So the course is kind of the, the foundation to everything. And within each course, we have a bunch of kind of different data. We have a name, um, we have a abbreviation, you know, like in this case, CIT 25. And I'm even going to put like an example column here. So this is the course. Let's uh, let's highlight this a nice dark gray. And, you know, so we have name abbreviation. Um, you know, like I said, let's keep it simple. So, for example, CIT or database development and design. Instead of abbreviation, I'm going to call it code. you know, CIT 225. Now, one thing that's kind of missing from here is some of our more database -y type data. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in here real quick because it's one thing we missed. So we obviously need a course ID, right? And that could just be a one. So anyways, there's, there's a course. So I'm going to throw a border around this. There's a course. Now, another table we might need is a section, right? There's multiple sections of a course. So we're going to put in section ID. Um, and I'm going to put in number. And I'm going to put in a teacher ID, right? And we'll, we'll put it in there. Actually, you know, I'm not going to put in a teacher ID. We're just going to leave it just like that. Um, and we'll come back around to the Y on that. I'm not going to do examples for the rest of these. And if it's helpful to you, feel free. If not, no worries. So this is when we have to kind of start thinking about like how databases are kind of put together, right? Um, so we have this section here and the only problem is, okay, how do we connect, connect a section to a course? And well, just like we talked about earlier, we need that what's called the, the foreign key. Um, so what, one thing we're missing here is a course ID. So what I like to do is I kind of like to always throw this up here. We're going to do a course ID. And, you know, I am going to put an example here just so we can keep things, keep things straight. So section ID one, course ID one, and number, let's just call it, call it all one. Clear that, get an outside border. All right. And now, so we now have uh, the ability to have a course and in individual sections. So like we might be section three, we might be section whatever. Um, in fact, let's do changes to a three just so we don't see two ones. So section three is tied to, you know, section ID three, let's call it one. Section ID one is tied to course one and, you know, it's section three. Now, what we're going to do next is we need to the ability to put people into this section. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a roster table. Um, and this roster is going to be kind of everyone, um, teachers, students, TAs, all that. And so everyone in the section is included in the roster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, we need our primary key. That's always first and foremost. And then we need, um, oh, our foreign key. So, you know, obviously this is for a section. We need the section ID. And then we need, um, you know, various information. So let's do a person ID, right? Because what is a roster? It's a list of people. So we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. What I like to always do is, you know, like I said, in spreadsheets, it's a little weird, but Whenever I hit a snag like that, I'll come up here and I'll say, okay, we need a person, person ID, 
is one. Um, some other information, you know, let's do first name, last name, you know, that kind of stuff. Let's just keep it simple. I'm going to do Frodo Baggins. Here's our person table. Right. And then now we can do this roster. But before I do the roster, because um, like I said, I want to be able to put everyone in here. So the other table I'm going to create is called a, um, let's, let's call it a role, right? So here we have a role ID. And I'm going to just give this a name. And let's, uh, let's call it a, Um, let's call it admin privilege flag, right? So let's say role ID one is a student and the admin privilege flag is empty. But let's say we have another one called teacher, admin privilege flag is one. You know, I'm kind of just making stuff up here, so... Um, we're just going to roll with it. But there's some more, there's some examples of some types of roles. And then finally, we're going to get to this roster. I'm going to throw this back here. And in this roster, we're going to make it set to, you know, we have this person ID. We're going to say one, because then it'll tie to Frodo Baggins. And in this case, we're going to say the Frodo Baggins. We're going to say the role ID that in which he's in this course is a student, so one, right? But let's say we had another person, like I'm just gonna put myself in here. All right, let's say we had another person, person ID two is me. Um, this is kind of how it would look. So same section, or sorry. So foreign key auto increments, obviously can't be two. So same section, the second person, but the role ID, we're gonna do two. Because, you know, I am a teacher, so to speak. So anyways, that's kind of how you can like kind of put this together. Um, you know, and I would say even like that, that's that's ample enough. You know, good enough exercise. Like I said, this is more, you know, from here, I would then go and put together my presentation and, and talk through why you did what you did. You know, like just like this, like, oh, I noticed that in Canvas, when I'm on the the roster and let me see if I can show this without showing anything that I'm not supposed to here. Um, yeah, I can't show that screen, but in the, in the roster table, it actually has a role um, for each person on the roster. So you can kind of like see like, Oh, the reason I did this is because um, you know, everyone in the list just has a different role you know, stuff like that. And it's a, it's a little backwards of thinking because we really like to think, you know, when we, when we think about um, traditional tables, you know, we really like to kind of just like add to, um, you know, and I, I see a lot of people when they do this assignment, you can tell it's hard to kind of disassociate from thinking about it objectively, like in the sense of objects themselves versus thinking about the data that's inside of it. Um, cause really all the database cares about is it what's in this column, right? This stuff is all the fluff, right? This, this is the house we're building the house and we don't know what people are going to fill it with yet. We just have to build it so that it can contain that, you know, um, make sure there's enough bathrooms, you know, all that kind of stuff. We just have to make sure that the boot is able to fit. And we do that based on, you know, building the, the proper connections, because depending on how you link this stuff, it changes. So anyways, I'm going to try to open Workbench one more time here and see if it works now that we've downloaded the latest version. And would we need to create like screenshots with the PowerPoint or something like that? Or are we good just like recording our screen and walking through the tables that we create in the spreadsheet? Yeah, I think you're good just to record um, okay. kind of just like walking through it. You know, which, whichever format is best for you, if you're better just to kind of like walk through it, that, that's great too. Um, 
So anyways, and like I said, we went through the the spreadsheet version, um, which is great if if that's more comfortable. I'm also going to show you how we do this. And I know we're um, already out of time, so I'm going to be very quick. Um, but I want to show you this because it will be um, good practice if you want to do the final project instead of the exam, which I would highly recommend because the final project, basically, as long as you meet all the requirements, which you have all semester to do, um, it, it's guaranteed 100% for the most, you know, as long as you do meet it all, you have a chance to turn it in before. So I usually can tell you if something's missing. Um, so it's almost a guarantee 100%. So I would highly recommend it. So we're going to hurry real quick, run through this. So I'm going to say a new model uh, and it's not going to work. So anyways, what I'll do since we're out of time is I will post a video from a previous semester where I go through and I build um, build a model because I don't know why it's not working um, on, on my computer. But anyways, um, I'll post that video. But basically you can actually... The, the amazing thing is you can build the model just like we did here, but you, you just add tables um, and kind of like fill out, you know, the different stuff. The only difference is you have to add a data type, but then it will actually build the database for you, um, which is pretty neat. So that's what you'll do for the final project. I will link the video when I shoot this recording out. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much that, that project. You can do it this way. Or you can do it through through Workbench, which you know I'll send that 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 other demo since mine's crashing for some reason. Does uh, anyone have any questions about this assignment? Um, on Workbench, uh, that should be like um, adding the tables and uh, relating uh, tables and creating like graphically all the database and then. Um, um do the process to convert all of it uh into code is that is that yes yep exactly and you only in this okay. case in for this assignment you don't have to convert it to an actual database um but for the basically for the the final project you, you will it'll be a kind of a part of that so if you do it um if you do it for this project basically put it together. And in fact, let me see if I can real quick find, um, find that video just so I can at least, uh, kind of show you, basically you put together what's called an ERD, mm -hmm. um, which it will basically be the end goal of, of this assignment where basically it's just like this almost, but you know, in the UI, it will actually link all this for you. Um, which is kind of nice. Um, Anyways, I don't know what's going on if it's still kind of like a consequence of my my outage, but for some reason YouTube's just spinning. So, oh, I mean, as soon as I say that, it goes. So let me um, let me see if I can find that real quick here. We will look for week two. Let's see if I can fast forward and find where we where we do this. Okay, so it looks like in this one, I walk through uh, Skidoo's website is what it looks like. Um. All right, so this is this is what I'll share, but basically it'll look like this um, when you start building that model, where essentially at the end, you know, we get to basically where you can use this graphical user interface and it'll link it all up. And, and so the output's almost the same, just, you know, ones through Workbench and ones just on a spreadsheet. This one's nice because this is what we'll use when we uh, when we work on the final project. So I'll link this video as well, um, but but yeah, just so you know, at the end of the day, you know when we uh, get it all put together, it will look something like like this, you know, and you can just kind of talk through how it's all connected.
like I said, the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that I usually see people do is they will, uh, instead of listing the, the columns that can hold multiple records, they'll like do things like this, where they'll say like, uh, you know, they'll build a table called fruit, right? This is our table name and they'll put like apple, orange, um, stuff like that. Keep in mind, we're not listing, um, you know, we're not building lists of things. We're, we're creating an object that can hold many items of the same type of thing. Just like we did here, you know, we could have course two be um, intro to web development, you know, um, CIT 230 or, you know, so on and so forth. They can hold many classes. And it's great if like that mentally helps you kind of see how it's connected, just kind of like how I did. Um, but, but really what we're, what we're interested in is this. Um, this is really all we care about for the, the database design. All right. I um, feel like I've beaten that horse enough. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stick around, feel free to shoot them in teams after this. Like if, if something comes up further on throughout the week, feel free to hit me up. I'm happy to answer. Um, otherwise, I hope you guys have a great week. And yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.